Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media production. And our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we're going to talk about business structure. Uh, is it an LLC, S Corp, C Corp? What, are, what should we be thinking about here? So uh, we'll be talking about business structure and what you need to know. We've got um, some great guests. Uh, Jason and Ryan Corolla are going to be here and they're going to uh, walk us through some of those uh, some of those details. So stay tuned for that. And if you've got questions about business structure, go ahead and throw those into Makana or you can throw them into our um, Q&A. So if you go askofficehours.global or just use that little QR code there, um, you can uh, actually ask those questions. And you can ask questions for the first hour. If it's the second hour, make sure that we know it's the second hour. Just put second hour at the beginning. Um, but uh, if it's the, it, but otherwise throw your questions in there and you can do that 24 seven. So uh, that URL works all the time and then we slowly feed those into the system. So, um, so go ahead and ask questions there or, in Makana. And if you're in Makana, make sure to vote those questions up and down. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? First one comes from Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And Josh asks, what are your best production experiences you've had this year? Crickets. <laughs> it's like everyone's like, well, yeah, go ahead, Bill. I'm going to I'm going to jump out front and say it's actually been the last 2 or 3 years but since I switched over from mostly shooting larger cameras to shooting iPhones I can't tell you the number of uh I'm looking forward to going out and shooting this little gig I'm going to be able to just take my monopod and my iPhone I'm not going to have to drag lighting I know that the quality of the work is going to come out surprisingly good there's still room for the big cameras, and I will never go away from, you know, I've got all these skills I've built for let's go out and light it and set and do EFP style rather than ENG. But just the sheer joy of being able to work with less bulky equipment and still get something that I'm happy with out the other end has been transformative for me. I'm really enjoying shooting again, and I hadn't, and after getting locked away for so long and not being able to go out through COVID and not shoot, I'm just finding that's joyful for me. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I want to be positive here. The, the one positive thing I have uh, experienced is, and I haven't switched all of them yet, but when I re started replacing these point-and-shoot cameras that I had to uh, a Lumix G7 camera, which is a micro four-thirds camera, it's nothing super high-end or anything, but the but the increased sensor size uh, has made a difference in the quality of the productions. My client has noticed it, and I've also seen people that don't know anything about production notice the the quality bump in, uh, as well, and it's and it's made a difference in in how people react to the show as well. So that's been a positive experience, unfortunately. And I won't talk about them. The laundry list of things that I need to improve and the other things <laughs> I need to change are way longer. Yeah, I, I think that um, the Gray Matter dot show, which is what we do with Michael Krasny, has kind of gotten into a little bit of a pattern now it's 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 working it's you know we've got we've kind of figured out all the bits and pieces of it and and i think that, that took us a little time to kind of get into that uh, we are looking at moving it to uh squadcast so that we have uh, local recordings so that's our new little thing that we're going to be um kind of moving uh moving towards but um but and still making a live show so i was um working with Je jeff cohen about that on that we're testing that where we can have still get a live show out of squadcast but have it be a, a, a double end record um and so those are the, that was a little bit of a um that we're slowly evolving that i think i find that that show to be um kind of fun because it's not as big as a lot of the shows that i do as far as the production there's not like huge crews but we're just slowly trying to make it you know just trying to make it a little bit better and of course the guests make it worth it because <laughs> because michael krasny has a really deep rolodex so somebody um, was saying the one with lee child that you did this weekend or last week was oh, just fabulous he is so, such an amazing author yeah lee lee child is the um author for reacher and uh and so he uh we we interviewed him and and uh it was funny the funniest quote was i haven't he, like this you know he's in his 60s i think or, or 70s and he's like i haven't been in a fight for 10 years and i was like 10 years like that means he was in a fight 10 years ago <laughs> so so anyway i was <laughs> just thought that was great anyway well that'll be coming out later this week all right let's go to the next question Kai Cochran, seattle washington did zoom just give everyone back hd and he's got a link there i go ahead courtney well, apparently they are, or they're, at least they're going to do it for new accounts. And existing accounts, uh, they're going to be able to roll it out. This is only for webinars and paid accounts, apparently. They're going to enable 720 and 
1080 HD. And the article says that it'll be immediately available for all new accounts with existing accounts regaining access in the next few months. So it's, they're going to roll it out gradually for their existing accounts and accounts that already have been enabled for 720 and 1080, like ours, for webinars, uh, have immediate access and nothing will change, apparently. Yeah, the, yeah the, um, it is, uh, I, and I, I believe it's for the individually paid webinar accounts. And I think that the distinction there is, is that I think webinar gets bundled into a lot of things. And I don't think it's necessarily part of that. Also, there's some additional tools that it, it outlines there, and those are really designed to allow IT departments to make some decisions about who, it's not automatically 1080p, because if you gave everybody 1080p in a company, in a large company, you may drown the, um, you may drown the, actually the, the connection to the rest of the world. So, so there are still um, additional controls that IT has um, to do it, but it does look like they're bringing back um, for, you know, and, and they're slowly rolling this resolution out to a lot of different places to make that more available. We can now get it if you pay $99 a month for sessions. Of course, you get a bunch of the tools as well as um, being able to go to 1080p. So um, a lot of the stuff was really hard to get during COVID. And I think that the, they're backfilling the infrastructure to allow it, allow it, all of us to use it, or at least people who are paying for the service. So it's great. And I uh, wonder if they're still going to discriminate against people with quad core. PCs. <laughs> the quad core discrimination is going to, yeah, we'll have to see. Uh, next question. Peter Maas in Belgium uh, comes up with, in a Zoom meeting or webinar with audio interpretation, I have discovered that when the active speaker listens to an interpreter channel, the audio of that channel is combined with the active speaker's audio. Can someone elaborate? There shouldn't be a reason for that um, automatically. The, reading the email, my guess is um, that you are um, leaving a speaker open. The speaker, the person who's talking is leaving their speaker open and it's feeding back into the system or it's somehow getting fed into the system. There shouldn't be any reason that Zoom is doing that. So ask that question again. If you've tested it and you're sure that you have headphones on and that your pipeline is completely separate to listen to that um, and you're not trying to do something where you have any any kind of complex pipeline with the, the audio, if, if you're still, if it's still being fed in for everyone else, just because the speaker opens that up and they don't have an open speaker and they don't have a complex audio system, then let us know because that sounds like it could be a bug. But I think from the surface, it looks like somebody's opening that that feed up and it's kind of feeding back in. Yeah. Uh, next next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas says, do we know enough about the new Elgato teleprompter for $279, which sits atop your monitor to put in a pre-order? He notes it's expected to ship between December 14th and the 17th this year. Good, Nigel. Yeah, I don't know. You can ever know enough, but I've seen it demoed on YouTube. And the particular thing I like about it is I thought it was just going to fit with the Elgato uh, uh, camera, the, the the webcam. But actually, they put uh, an, a connections for most lens sizes in the box. So as long as you've got a fairly standard uh, lens on your camera, that really should work for anything. And I really like the fact that it's also integrated with the Stream Deck. So one of the problems for most of us is if we use something like an iPad as our teleprompt, then we can't use it as an interotron because it can't necessarily show the video. And the fact that at a switch of button, you can change from one to the other because it's just another monitor. It looks like, I think, a really good solution for most people. Go, Jason. Yeah, I agree with Nigel. We can never know enough, but I knew enough to pull the trigger and order one. Uh, mine is coming in November, so I'm happy to share with the group when it arrives uh, early in November. I would say I just like that the whole thing is integrated, that it has the ability to handle those interchangeable lenses, which is nice. And I'm hoping, like I think a number of you are, that this may be the kind of kit, uh, the kind of teleprompter that we can put into a kit that we can send out to people when we want them to participate in live streams, but they don't have um, the kind of amazing setup that some of you do. So, Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I dove a little deeper into the specifications of it, and because uh, I was looking at the monitor and how it it works, and I noticed it said something like a single single cable, and it hooks up its power over USB C. So the this monitor that they have, and here's a selection of the parts here, you so you can see it looks like the monitor and the hood are together on uh, a plastic part. And the display is 1024 by 600, and its interface is USB C. Uh, which means that it's a display port, a virtual uh, port, and it only works if it's plugged into a PC or a Mac. Um, 
or Linux. Uh, I guess they have drivers for all three of those because it, it sets itself up as a separate display on your computer so that they can invert it, I think, in software. That's what I think is probably going on. And it does say you have to have Display Link drivers installed on your PC, on your computer to run it. So, um, and at that strange resolution, it's going to set up a separate screen on your computer. So sliding things off and on to this computer may be problematic uh, uh, resolution-wise because it's going to have to change resolution as it goes across. Uh, that could be problematic. I mean, it's nice that there's only one cable, but that USB-C cable can't be very long, so you're going to have to have your computer fairly close to this thing. But to be used as in the setup that they depict it as, as a eye contact for YouTubers that are doing Zoom meetings, it's perfect for that kind of stuff. Uh, as a regular teleprompter to put it on a steady cam or something, that's what I was kind of interested in it for. But it looks like it won't be able to do that because you'd have to plug in a USB-C cable to it. Uh, and those are going to make it pretty tough to use in a moving around situation. Go, Bill. I think there's a lot of uses for it. Uh, like Courtney, I think the size of it is the thing that concerns me most. I mean, here it is up at the top of this. And I don't think that's tremendously large for some things. For example, I my interest is moving into a teleprompter system where I can put the grid view up when I'm in the show here. And um, I think that's going to be too small for that. I think it's the right size for what uh, Courtney's talking about, for somebody who wants to um, just have a teleprompter up over their eyeline screen and read text off of it. I had hoped it was a little bigger so that I could put a grid up and still kind of pick people because that's part of what I have to do when I'm hosting on Thursdays and things like that. So I, I think it's a really, it looks like a well-designed device for the one thing that it's designed to do. And so I can't really fault them for that. Go, Jason. Yeah, my issue is that al although it does have up to an 82 millimeter spacer, which of course will, will support the largest lenses you can think of, um, you don't end up with very much space on the back end and trying to get a larger camera uh, to fit on there, like the, the 24 to 70 uh, 2.8 that, that I have is, is going to be a little tricky. Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. Why do many manufacturers not publish pricing information in a product announcement? Go ahead, Nigel. I think there are lots of reasons for this. First of all, it may be historical. They've never put prices in. Second of all, it may be that at the time of the press release, they haven't agreed the price. Uh, third, they may just not want you to know it because it's sold through different channels. Uh, you know, the internet has made everything very transparent. So there'd be lots of things you could do in ye olden daisy where you could sell different products at different prices through different channels. And you don't get away with a lot of that anymore. But, but the most obvious reason is really the second one, which is at the time of the product going to market, they don't want to let you know what the price is going to be. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, it depends on the type of product, too. If it's a new product that's never existed before, uh, you know, they can kind of want to wait and gauge the market to see what they can get for it till the last minute. And if they're going in as a, but if they're going into a old market, let's say they've got a, a competitive product that's going into an already existing market, so they're going to be competing with many other manufacturers of the same type item, they, and they want to be disruptive, then they'll advertise the price early, and they'll have to make sure that manufacturing, they can hit that price point uh, before they advertise it. And sometimes until they get into full-on production, you know, if they're in pilot production or something, that may not give them a full, a full gauge of how much it's going to actually cost to produce that product. And if they advertise too low a price to disrupt the market, they might find themselves selling the thing at a loss, uh, which is a major problem, which they might be able to get away with for the first month or so of the introduction, and the price is going to have to be raised as production costs, uh, you know, if they balloon up. So uh, cost is a very dangerous thing to set in advance if you don't know how the market is going to react. And also your competitors may lower their price to match yours. Uh, so then everybody loses money. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I just think the world of pricing has changed entirely. It used to be that manufacturers would do MSRP, manufacturers suggested retail price. Everybody was kind of constrained to offering the product at that for a while. Now in the internet fully connected real time, it's kind of more an internet 
floating price. And we've all seen examples. You go on and search out something and it gives you a price. And then a day later, you get a little ping and the price is suddenly 10% lower because they realized you're now an interested prospect and they're trying to close the sale by using price as a driver for that. I just think we're in a new world where there's so much of that going on that there is no such thing really as a fixed price for much of anything anymore. If you can't find it one place for 10% less, you can find it in another place. Go ahead, Chris. I think some of it might be strategy. I think that by saying, you know, contact us, which some people do, you know, contact us for pricing, you've immediately, um, first of all, you've weeded out not serious customers. You've honed in on people that are more serious. You probably have contact information because they contacted you. And you get to engage with them, you know, con- t- talk to a sales representative and find out your price. You get to engage with them and they get, <clears throat> excuse me, and they get to um, make their case for why they've chosen a certain price. I, I think sometimes it's strategic. Yeah, I think that um, they don't want you to call, <laughs> ping them or, or be on forums going, why is this box $25,000 or why is this box $60,000? And the reality is, is that prices changed. The prices changed a lot. I've had boxes that, on paper, like when you see the retail price, it is one hundred and ten thousand dollars for one piece of hardware. And by the because of the fact that we work with the company a lot, we buy, we bought a bunch of stuff in the past that ends up being, you know, with a package and doubled up with another one or something else. You end up paying one hundred or you pay sixty thousand dollars. You know, like and literally the number changed um, in by <laughs> fifty fifty thousand dollars with a couple conversations. So a lot of times those numbers are there. Um, and again, they those are where it's not published, but it, it also means that there's a lot of horse trading going on to to get to the final price, um, especially when there's a lot of margin involved um, is usually where you see most of that. Next question. Mark, um, excuse me, Mark Coster, uh, Orem, Utah. I have a goal of starting a quality YouTube channel this year, and I'm interested to know if anyone can offer a short list of the minimum equipment needed to get started the right way, not the cheapest way, but the right way that will produce uh, quality resolution. I go ahead, uh, Alex. Okay, so as someone who's dealt with autofocus issues and substandard autofocus for a while now, if I were going to do it over, I'm going to suggest a couple options here. On the slightly higher end, a Sony FX30 would be an excellent camera to start with. Uh, I would go with that because, I mean, Sony's autofocus, everyone knows this. I mean, you you see Alex Lindsay using it all the time, and it just, you know, it works, Uh, especially if you don't have the luxury of a camera operator. I would get the digital XLR interface for that as well so you can get good quality audio into the camera so it's perfectly time aligned with the the video going in. And then for microphones, you know, I would get a dynamic microphone that has good off-access rejection like uh, Electrovoice RE20, that's always a classic, Shure SM7B, and then get yourself an audio interface that has a good quality preamp that's going to give you enough headroom that's not going to be noisy and that's going to be able to handle those microphones well. The Lewitt Connect 6 is a two-channel interface that has, I think it's 70 or 75 dB of gain, really clean preamps. It also has dynamics processing, so it gives you the parametric EQ, the compression, the downward expansion that you'd probably want on your voice as well. So that's a, a pretty good start to go with. Go ahead, Bill. My suggestion is that, yes, you do need minimal equipment and you need to have at least reliable stuff in order to do the practice necessary to get better at this. But I also just want to always make a note that buying a better piano does not make you a better piano player. What makes you a better piano player is doing it over and over again. So try to get all these equipment things sorted as fast as you can and start producing your show because the only way to get to a quality show is by what we do here at Office Hours. It's starting wherever you can start and then incremental improvement over time. Pay attention to dialing up the content as opposed to the medium and the equipment and that'll give you a better chance of, of succeeding, I think, than just trying to find exactly the right equipment and taking too much time to get there. Good, Chris. Here we go, Alex. I'm going to try to not be mean. So, Mark, here's the thing about YouTube channels. Uh, that's a huge umbrella, right? There, there could be a, a, there's a million different types of YouTube channels. You, you live in Utah. Maybe you want to do like a four-wheel drive YouTube channel. Maybe you want to do a sit at your desk and talk about, you know, unboxing stuff from Amazon channel. Maybe you want to do, you know, a Casey Neistat run around uh, 
Orem, Utah, and talk about all the crazy stuff in your town and, and introduce everybody to your UPS driver. Um, it really depends. I mean, it, it, you know, what's the hinge? Oh, it, it depends. So it, there's a million different ways to do that. Uh, it's like, you know, how much does a house cost? Well, it depends. You want a, a view of the beach or not? So what I would what I would say is that what matters more to me than cameras and mics and bears oh my is, is it something that's worth watching? Some of the YouTube channels that I watch, that I watch religiously, use no wireless mics. They just have a little mic on top of their camera. One of my favorite YouTube channels shoots everything. She shoots everything on her iPhone. She puts a little handle on it so she feels a little more pro. And you know what? When the people are too far away, they don't sound good. When they come up close to the mic, they sound good. And I forgive them because it's entertaining. It's, it's fun content. I would worry about that much more than, you know, what you need to put in your uh, shopping cart on Amazon. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I think that you can do almost everything with your iPhone at this point that, that would be um, enough to get an, a, a, a YouTube channel off the ground. That said, you, you know, it, 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 is, it does look nicer when you start to, <laughs> if, if, you, if you kick it out um, with some, you know, shorter depth of field. I think the FX30 is a really solid camera. I, I might be tempted to go to an FX3 just because it's a buy one, cry once. You know, you get to an FX3, you've got a full frame sensor. That means that stuff's going to look better with a zoom lens on um, so that you may want to um, think about that, that, you know, jumping to an FX3. Uh, I would personally still use, uh, I find that the, the Mix Pre 3 is just this great little thing that has noises, you know, the noise assist and everything else there. Zoom also makes some, their, their F series is also very good as far as being able to record things in the field, but you do want to have something that's going to record in the field. Um, I think that for voiceovers, I think the MV7 works well. The SM7B is a great, um, you know, mic to talk, you know, talk into or a PR40. The, um, I would think about having some kind of shotgun like a Rode NT2 um, is, a, is a pretty solid, it's not perfect, it's, but it's relatively inexpensive um, to make that work, of, you know, it's, and um, as a shotgun. Uh, I'm not a big fan of labs. <laughs> People use them. Uh, I, I just don't, I, it's hard to make them sound good in my opinion, um, but, but you might want to do that. And then think about lights. Um, I find for balancing cost effectiveness and quality, I have a lot of NAND lights. <laughs> so, so, so I would look at their s series of, you know, I use little 6Cs when I travel. I have two 68Bs up here is above, above what I'm doing here. And so, um, so I think that those, those balance uh, cost effectiveness with quality really nicely. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, and I forgot to mention, and you did mention shotgun mics. You know, you look at a lot of high, some of these higher end YouTubers, they don't really have mics in the shot too. So I know a lot of them use, like a Gerald Undone uses the Sennheiser MKH 8050. It's a very expensive uh, microphone, but um, you know, he's got that one boomed right above his head. You don't have to spend $1,500 on a type of microphone like that. Uh, you know, Alex mentioned some of the Rode uh, NTG microphones, so you can get one for about $400, $500. Just get it relatively close to your face, just out of frame, and it'll sound pretty good. And the main thing is, is that if you are using a shotgun mic, let's say, and, and I do love shotgun mics for a lot of things, and you can hang them just right outside the frame. But also remember that as you start to use a shotgun or a, or a lav, um, think about how, what your room treatment looks like. So just remember that like the room that I'm in right now, I have this kind of large diaphragm mic. I have moving blankets all where you can't see me. <laughs> so, so that that's, and otherwise the room that I'm in is unusable. So, so you have to really think about room treatment as well. The other thing that I would recommend is start doing some of these before you post them on YouTube, start to um, post some of these, jump into after hours or send some of us, you know, some, some stuff and ask for feedback and, and let us kind of, we can save you a lot of time, you know, like, so if you get some of this basic stuff and you start to shoot, um, you can, you know, we can save you time on going, oh, you might want to think about this, this, and this, and we're happy to help. Next question. Jack Rupel, Breckenridge, Colorado. I'm using Apple's Freeform, and since it is an infinite canvas, how can I print a large canvas cheaply at a local service? Do I have to convert it to a PDF? Jason? Short answer is yes. And the size which you choose to export it, uh, I've, I dug way down into this. Embedded graphics don't 
actually go out, even if they come in as, as um, vectorized graphics, they become bitmaps at the size that you export the PDF. So if, if you want to take it to Kinko's or something, you might want to end up like exporting a PDF and then choosing your page or your aspect ratio cutout and then sending them individual um, specific sizes. Next question. Next one comes from Andre Dalle in Berlin. Alex, please check the 5X zoom of your camera app. Mine uses a 120 millimeter lens only for time lapse, slow mo, and panographs, not for photo, video, and portrait. These use the 1X lens, 5X magnified. Blackmagic app uses the 120 millimeter lens. Huge bug or my bad, and do you have a fix? And that's one of our QR code questions from this morning. I find it fascinating that it would use the 5X for the pano. <laughs> Like, how would you do that? Um, yeah, so so I I, uh, I find this to be very fascinating. I felt like I was getting, I don't know, I, I have to go back and look. I really thought like, like we were getting a solid 5X when I set it to 5X um, in the phone, but um, I now have to feel like I have to go back and check. So um, so we'll let us take a look at that. I have not tested that that heavily. Um, I, again, most of the stuff that I've done with 5X so far has been more fun than anything that would remotely look like work. So I haven't looked at it probably as with as, um, as closely as I should have. So we'll take a look at that and find out if that's actually the case. Um, it is another case for using the Blackmagic app if you're gonna be doing that. And I, I'm assuming that anything I would do professionally with my phone, I'd probably use the Blackmagic app to capture it. By the way, I, I, I do think, I, I, guess, I guess a question for everybody here is whether it makes sense to break down some of these Apple commercials. I, I, I went through the one with, uh, um, uh, uh, Olivia Rodrigo, um, that is, you know, sh the music video of her on the street. And there's a lot of like, you could break down like all the pieces of hardware that they're using with, uh, her music video. And I don't know if anybody's done that yet, but it seems like there's uh, you know, you, you, as you look at the behind the scenes, you know, they, they're showing behind the scenes to show off the camera. I have a feeling this is going to be a series for Apple where they, and they've done it in the past, yeah. but I have a feeling they're going to show more of these videos where they're showing the actual hardware. It might be kind of a fun sport. To break out well this is a this is a um you know this is the small rig this is the these are noga arms these are this is a this is a, a they, they have a motion control they have the iphone on a motion control arm go ahead bill well i think that would be fascinating i think maybe if we've got a spare thursday coming up we should do that as the show because i think that's fascinating as well i mean they've yeah. got all the money and all the talent and all the everything at their disposal and so now they have to shoot with an iphone for internal reasons how are they doing it I think it'd yeah. be fascinating. Yeah, I think it's, there's there's some stuff to learn there. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Alexander Knight here on the panel from Port Coquitlam, British Columbia. How exactly does autofocus support and control work on Blackmagic switchers and non-Blackmagic design cameras? Is it just a single area draw a box around the area you want to focus on? So the autofocus um, control works does not work with non black magic cameras so it's asking the camera to do an autofocus and when the camera does the autofocus what it's doing is i as far as i can tell it's not really looking at a specific area what it does is it it does a, a high pass filter so it's a it basically if you do a if you go into photoshop and you take an image and you do a high pass filter on it it'll turn all gray except you'll see where the all the edges are where the delta is and, and what you're going to see there is that's exactly what you're going to, that's what the camera's using. And what it's doing is then it's moving in and out to try, and you'll see it go, or, or, or going back and forth because what it's doing is it's moving that lens and looking for where that get those, those lines get the thinnest and the most and the, and the brightest. And that's also, by the way, what drives when you see um, focus assist, focus assist is doing that high pass and then, and then turning that red. So that's the, um, uh, so that's, that's how, how you get focus assist on it. Um, and the, the, um, so that's, that's how it works. It's a very rudimentary autofocus and, and in, in defense of black magic, a lot of cameras don't have autofocus. I mean, we're, because you're in social media, we think about autofocus a lot because I'm sitting here in front of this camera and I want to be able to do this. And then I want to be able to have it come back. I think that that is a different need for it. Uh, if you look at, um, the auto, you know, Aries and, you know, uh, Venice's and, Lots of other cameras don't have autofocus built into them. So it's not like it's a required thing to have that. Blackmagic adds that to it. That's why it's a cinema camera is so that, it, that it's doing that. 
um, and and they're expecting you to have some kind of control over it and not use it as a web camera. You know, so so but but I will say that out of the switcher, um, that's the switcher is just asking the camera to do it, and it's talking to its own cameras. But there's no support from ext for external cameras right now that I know of. Uh, next question. Taylor Sunderhouse is up next from Cincinnati, Ohio. I am setting up my own captioning system for a local TV station. I'm looking for a device that will enable captions into my video chain. What device do you recommend to do this? So, I mean, when it comes to a piece of a, a hardware appliance that adds the captioning to the line 21, the bank data that's sitting in there so that it works properly for a television station, what you are looking for is an EEG 492. <laughs> like that is the that is the device that does this. Um, uh, it's owned by AI Media, bought EEG, um, and EEG makes this. It's a it's not a cheap device. I think it's five or six thousand uh, dollars, maybe more now with inflation. Um, it is a piece of hardware. The video goes in, video goes out. You can have it burn it into the video, or you can have it just just applied to the to the bank. It's got its own decoder or not. Um, and it's designed to do that, and now it's sitting inside of that, and it goes out to broadcast, and that's what it's built to do, and it does it really well. Um, that piece of hardware can either be um, uh, connected to – there's a um, uh, there's a variety of different ways of connecting it. It can, can be connected to a captioner, so they use the thing called iCap, um, which basically um, connects connects the piece of hardware to someone who's sitting somewhere in the world – listening to your show and typing <laughs> and it come, and literally goes, it's embedded into it. They also have a series of uh, hardware solutions, Falcon and a couple other solutions that are, that will do it with AI. So, <clears throat> and so, but, but that's a service that you get with that piece of hardware. But if you're looking for a piece of hardware that's going to seamlessly and reliably insert caption data into a line 21, you are looking for an EEG 492. 491 will work as well, but a 492 is the newest one. Next question. Alexander Knight is back from Port Coquitlam here on the panel. Uh, is there a limitation on how many stream decks you can run on BitFocus Companions, uh, a BitFocus Companion server? I've seen setups with three, but I'm curious how far you could take it. I bet you there's not a limit. <laughs> I don't see why. The, uh -oh. I don't see why there would be a limit. Um, but but I, I the only way to find out is to just keep adding stream decks until it stops working. But I, I don't know. Like, I don't see why, you know, why there would be a, um, why they would limit that, you know, there's doesn't seem to be any reason for them to limit the addressable um, systems. If you're doing more, if it's, if it's more than one, it should be able to, you should be able to just keep going. Quick reminder, of course, that you can ask questions throughout the hour. Um, you can uh, ask them in Mukana. Um, and so you can, you can just go ahead and ask, ask those questions. First hour, of course, is general media. Uh, and second hour, we're going to be talking about business models, our business structure. So if you've got questions about those, go ahead and throw those in for the second hour. Just make sure to tell us that uh, or make tag it inside of Makana. Or if you're using this little QR code here or going to askofficehours.global, you can go ahead and just say second hour just to make sure we know it's there. But you can throw that in any time of the day. So you can ask questions for today if you ask them right now. Uh, if you ask them between shows, We'll file them in the next day. So go ahead and throw those questions in. All right, next question. Douglas Carmichael is up next. The TD Garden Arena in Boston has introduced sensory rooms for event attendees on the autism spectrum and with sensory sensitivities. As event producers, should we be more aware of the needs of that population and what we produce? I go ahead, Nigel. You should always be aware of the population that you're serving. And uh, it's, of course, hard to know exactly whether you're going to have somebody with those needs at your event. But wherever possible, I don't know most of us are doing events that quite reached the same level as the TD Garden. I also heard that the uh, Sphere actually has a room that if you just find it completely overwhelming, you can go and sit in and, and calm down. What's TD Garden? I actually don't know what that it's is. It's the Boston Arena. It's where oh. the... Uh, it's a big arena downtown Boston near one of the best pizza restaurants in the world called Regina's. What is it called? Regina's Pizza. Maybe Regina's. the best pizza in the world, just around uh, the corner. I know. Bon better than Bonchi in Rome? Have you been to Have you been to the uh, Bonchi Pizza in Rome? Yeah, but I'm talking American pizza, so we were in a different conversation. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. So am I going to understand this proper, uh, right, that they have special, like, isolation rooms if you have sensory sensitivity? Yeah. So that it's like a box seat? Like, and does this have to be like a medically diagnosed thing or, or like, 
Dude, it's a just, quiet time. Chris just what if quiet what time. if all the other people just enrage me? Can I get one of those box seats like that? Because <laughs> that, I could see that be a thing. Yeah, I have no idea how these work. And I'm not you know, saying I. It, I'm not saying I wouldn't abuse the privilege. I would. I would also roll in in a wheelchair if it meant I got more leg room. Yeah, the um, the, you know, it's interesting. A lot of large airports actually have a lot of these things hidden into them as well, if, especially like ones that have been built in a more modern environment. So, like uh, Dubai Airport, for instance, has you know meditation rooms and uh, rooms for different religions to 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 pray and and to you know, it's it's quite a. I mean, they've they've really built out a lot of those those extras into those, and I think I think it's great. Go ahead, Nigel. Yeah, I was going to say, normally the way into these things is through a medical professional. So I was in a large field in Texas for a Formula One race, and there were people dropping all over the place. And they had cooling rooms. But to get into the cooling room, you need a medical professional to allow you in. Um, that's normally the way through. When is the race in, Ve in Vegas? Uh, I think two weeks or something. You, you ask John, he'll tell you all about the traffic. He's really excited by it. <laughs> John, Mid-November. No Mid-November. Uh, and Nigel, you're going, right? No, no. We did Miami and we did Austin this year. And uh, I, we were in Vegas a couple of weeks ago, and it is just a complete disaster with the road. So we're going to let all the Vegas people uh, experience it for the first time. It doesn't actually look a terribly exciting track, um, but it's going to be a very interesting experience. Plus the fact, because they're really appealing to a market in the rest of the world, Quali, which is will be the most important part of this, which is where do you start the race, is at midnight Vegas time. Right. <laughs> Nothing like having uh, F1 uh, uh, race cars ri driving through uh, your, your town. They don't make any noise, right? No, no they're, they're quiet. Here it's pretty quiet, actually. Uh, you can sleep right through it. Um, <laughs> next question. Next one comes to us from Jack Rupel, Breckenridge, Colorado. And Jack says, can marketers or anchors be placed in a Gaussian splat so that it may be used in other 3D software or placed during processing? I think we're off. I think we're off by oh, one. Oh, I'm, I'm off? I'm reading, I'm reading oh, is it there. Douglas Carmichael? Okay, yeah, yeah. sorry about that. That's the next question. We'll get there in a moment. Uh, Twitch recently changed their simulcasting policy to allow Twitch streamers to simulcast on other platforms if the experience isn't degraded, quote, close quote, thoughts. And he's got a link there. Uh, Twitch said that people who are live streaming can continue to do what they were already doing because they were ignoring them anyway. <laughs> you know, like that. I mean, it was like it was a dumb idea. And, and you know, Twitch, Twitch had this thing. I mean, every every platform goes through uh, every platform goes through this moment where they go, "Hey, people don't think we're as important." So what they do is they just add us as a simulcast. We don't want to just be a simulcast. We want to be the only cast. You know, we don't we don't want to be part of the problem. We want to be all of the problem. And, and so the, the issue is, is that, uh, they, everybody that Facebook did this, others, other, I don't think YouTube did it cause they were kind of first and they were like, didn't care. But, but I think that like Facebook did this for a while and they left it there as a rule for years and everyone just ignored it. <laughs> like no, no, no one even paid attention to that rule. The only time you, if you had Facebook, like as a partner, you couldn't do it. But outside of that, everybody just, you streamed to Facebook and YouTube and, and everything else. And so. Um, Twitch, I think, was trying to, you know, I think Twitch has got some uh, issues related to the problem for Twitch is that a lot of their value is really the interaction with the audience. Um, but their audience is very specific to games and is built up around that. And it's not really a great audience for a lot of other things. And so what happens is if you just push video to Twitch and you don't interact with the audience at all, it really is not a great, it's a really bad experience for the audience because they're used to being part of this like, I don't know, scrum that they, that they do in the, in the chat. And, um, and I think that, so it's, it, then you have people not wanting to, not wanting to watch it on Twitch and that's not good for not watch, not liking Twitch and feeling like Twitch is lesser than and all those other things. And I think that was what they're trying to solve. And, and the streamers just kind of ignored it and just kept on doing what they're doing because everybody has all these threats. You're not supposed to stream RTMP to Instagram and you're not supposed to do this and everyone always finds a way around it. And then the problem is, is that high profile streamers find their way around it and you can't cut them off. Um, and so then they get into this thing where they can't, they can't um, really apply the rule to everyone and then it just becomes a big mess. And so then they, and then they give up. And this is the pattern that we've seen for the last decade. Next question. Jack Rupel is back with the one that I pre-did uh, in Breckenridge, Colorado. Can maker, can markers or anchors be placed in a Gaussian splat so that it may be used in either 3D software, in other 3D software, or placed during process? If I ever do a band, I'm calling them the Gaussian splats just because of this question. 
or the nerfs. Uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Jason. Yes, best punk band name ever. Uh, yeah, we've seen Nick Jeshishan do this um, in many, many different ways, not the least of which is um, just with, with uh, the real 3D engine. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the issue is, is that the, um, you know, Gaussian Splat is kind of related to nerfs. Um, and, and the issue is, and this would be a great, conver- the great probably a great question for Eric uh, Geisler, who's going to be here um, uh, tomorrow, because he's really into this, this vertical specifically. Um, but the, um, the problem you have is that in a, in a nerf environment, you don't really have 3D data. Like it's, it, it is a, it is a, um, uh, it doesn't ha- it's a real time radiance field. And so it's, it's, it's in real time, it's, it's interpreting where you are and how you're moving through that, but it doesn't have geometry that you can latch onto. So what you can do, <laughs> excuse me, to this point is you could do something where you have 2D or even 3D data, but you would have to track it optically. There's not anything there to do it, um, to track, and it would be a little bit complex uh, to make that happen. But it, it's not it's not that it would be impossible. I I feel like you'd be making it pretty hard to do that. <laughs> like that, That's a lot of work. I'm not sure what the payoff is there. Uh, next question. Like trying to determine the geometry of cotton. Well, candy. it's there. It's just it's just that you're you're. It's like you're interacting with video, and at that yeah. point, you know, you're. I mean, but the, the advantage is is that. I mean, to go back to that just for a second, the advantage is is that you could you could use a um a nerf to like capture an environment that you want to put your hosts into. Then you have the hosts in there, and you're tracking the camera. And th- theoretically, you have that camera position, so you wouldn't even have to track it. You would be able to have the telemetry of the camera position, let's say, in a three D environment. And then you'd be able to deliver that telemetry back to your NERF environment, and that NERF environment would then move theoretically exactly the same as the one that is their foreground. So your foreground and the background will be rela- interrelated to each other, possibly to the pixel. Um, it, it would be, you know, and so it is a way to kind of tie those things back together. But it, it, it's a getting, I think, that getting everything correct, especially just remember that it's not just the position to attach to your Nerf camera, you're gonna have to make sure that your focal length and everything else is identical to the um, to the camera that's in your 3D environment or your real environment. Next question. Uh, Jeff Cohen in Miami Beach, Florida is up next. How do you exchange contact information when meeting someone in the real world? What's that? A contact act workflow auto-populating your CRM, customer relationship management system, with follow-up reminders, an AI-generated drip email newsletter campaign, or just send them a text? Go ahead, Nigel. I have this thing. You may not recognize this if you're young. It's called a business card. And so that's the uh, the primary way that uh, if I'm... Where do you put uh, the batteries? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, of course, the modern business card comes with a QR code or even comes with a Wi-Fi chip in it. So, um, And your modern uh, iPhone can just allow you to uh, zap the details. I think the question is, are you sharing your details or are you trying to capture data? And if you're trying to capture data, particularly on the stand or um, at a trade show, then you need to first of all find out if there are some restrictions within that trade show about what capture device you can use, you may find that they've already committed to one. Um, if there are no restrictions, you'll find any one of cheap tools can do it. Um, what many of us do, depending on what event it is, you just capture cards, you take details, and then you feed them into a CRM later. But you, you, if you are at an event, you really need to check with the event people if there's a particular one that connects to their system and they'll produce the data for you. Go, Jason. I use a business card or airdrop, and to digitize, I use a scan snap. Bill? I think in the newest version of iOS, they're, uh, they're, pl- they're promoting right now on the phones that they've done what other phone manufacturers have before, which is there's a new near field bump uh, thing that does a direct contact change. I got some kind of notification of that the other day, and uh, a little Apple produced video saying, if you want to use this and you're going to a trade show or something like that, just get the, the tops of the two phones close together. And if you preset it, it'll transmit contact information of your choosing with limitations that you put on it instantly. So I think other phones have had that for a while. Apple's got it now. Go, Jason. Um, I would just add that I think how you intake that information is less important than what you do with it once you have it. And that workflow can be the same regardless of whether that information is obtained in a digital environment or in person, 
using CRM tools and having a workflow for what you do when you get a contact to initiate a relationship with them, move it forward, add it to your mailing list so that you can continue to, um, you know, improve upon that relationship over time. I think those are the most important things to think about. Yeah. And, um, I don't, I, I, for all the people I meet, I'm not a really big like shotgun of like, let's get lots of cards <laughs> you know, or let's get, you know, I'm usually trying to, you know, talk to people about it. I'll usually only take a handful of cards back from a, from a, I used to take lots. I'd take a hundred back or 150 back from any given thing. Cause I'd sp I usually speak at conferences. So people come up and do it. I, I, I tend not to push as hard as I used to. If I really have a great conversation with someone, I usually connect with them on LinkedIn. You know, like it's, it's one of those things that I pretty quickly will connect with them just because that seems to be a pretty solid place to, and I, and I will admit, it, you know, it seemed odd back in the day to do that. But now if you go to someone's LinkedIn, nothing's happening. You're like, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> like it's, 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 and if you're not on LinkedIn, I would, I would recommend it at this point. I mean, it seems to be the one social network that seems to, to, to continue to thrive uh, inside of all of this stuff because it's a little more serious um, and, uh, and a little more connected. So I would, I would recommend it. Go ahead, Bill. It's called Name Drop on the new iOS, and it just came in with iOS 17. So if you have an iPhone and you're already updated to 17, do a search on Name Drop. It's part of the OS now. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas says, do you think your iPhone needs a battery? How do you test it? Oh, I think your iPhone needs a battery. Anyway, how do you test it? How do you know if your battery's going bad? And do you send it into Apple or go to the crowded Apple store to get it replaced? Go ahead, Mark. So you can go into settings, and under settings, you can search for battery. There you'll find battery health and charging, and then there's another tab you can click that'll give you the maximum capacity of your battery. So, for instance, it'll tell you at what point will it charge up to, and then you can determine whether you need a new phone or not. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, well, Mark said, and also I've, I've found historically that when the battery gets to the point where it is really, really bad, you'll actually get a pop-up on your phone that says you should get it serviced. And if you want to do that, I mean, you can, you know, preventative maintenance. If you're not happy with the way the battery is right now, you can just book the appointment. If you don't already have the app, get the Apple support app from the app store and then just book the appointment. It's really easy. Yeah, I'm curious, uh how many years it takes for the battery to really degrade. Um, now, I admit, because I'm on a show, I swap my phones pretty often. I mean, I, at least once a year. So I don't really have an experience of that. And I have phones that are sometimes two years old or, or three years old. And a lot of times my degradation is very low. Like it's like I see, you know, no, like three year, a three year phone might be still 94, 95% effective. And I'm wondering if there's, you know, I think we talk about, behaviors of what it takes to, you know, burn out your battery on any of these um, systems. Yeah, good, Courtney. Yeah, one thing to be careful of is, and a lot of times a good indicator that your battery uh, needs to be replaced is if your phone is starting to come apart at the seams. If the screen is lifting up or you see a bulge <laughs> on the back, do not continue to use your phone take it in immediately because it's at uh, one uh, bad bump and you could find your pocket on fire so be careful about the the a lot of the batteries will start to swell when they can no longer take a charge or when you try and charge them and they have uh, depleted cells inside as part of the battery so uh, that's a symptom if the battery is swelling you need to have it replaced or to uh, dispose of the phone in a careful manner like put it in something that is not flammable like a bucket until you can get it replaced good jason so the degradation rate i think it, it's for iphones um they're designed to retain 80 percent capacity for 500 cycles and however you you do those 500 cycles albeit you know 10 percent at a time 20 percent at a time that's how I don't look. find 500 for 80 percent. I mean, I know I've been 500 more than 500, and I haven't had that. You're problem. probably right, but that's you know that's their metric. That's that's what they're shooting for. I go to Alex. Yeah, this is just only one example, but my mom had an iPhone. Well, she had she still has an iPhone 8, and it took five years before the phone said, "Yeah, you should get that battery serviced." Go, ahead, Bill. I have both two iPhones and two sets of AirPod Pros, and it's interesting to me. I am pretty constantly, because I've been doing a lot of exercise lately uh, with the AirPods, I, I'm getting a lot of 
this set of AirPods needs to go through a deep cycle thing and it'll say leave it in for 15 hours or something like that or leave it in uh, overnight – and it does a, the complete refresh of the batteries in there. Now, those ones in the AirPod Pros are very small, so I can see them needing to. But my phone has done the same thing. Uh, there's a pretty sophisticated energy management system built into most of these phones. And I do think that the algorithm that they have behind that has gotten more and more sophisticated. So it is constantly monitoring whether the store and discharge cycles are optimized for the life of the thing. And if you're starting to do it wrong because you're doing too many short or long charges or whatever, it will communicate with you if you keep it in a system where you can see what's going on with it. Go ahead, Nigel. Here's a random piece of information for you. My Tesla this weekend said, your low power battery is not working. Please get it replaced. So even in a Tesla, you need a battery to boot up a battery. So I guess Tesla's IPL will bootstrap from a low power battery to a large one. So you never know where there's a battery. Well, I think, isn't the low-power battery the one that, that basically keeps all the subsystems running when the car is off? So yeah, it's not really you turning. need it to load the program that will then drive the uh, high-power battery. It's the watch right? battery on the motherboard. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, and importantly, it unlocks and locks the car. <laughs> you know? yeah, and, one, and one thing that I would, uh, I would also say about, it depends on what apps you're using on your phone. Uh, I will say that um, not having meta apps on my phone has doubled the battery life. Like, like doubled it, like not, not like a little, like, so I, I don't put them on my phone. I'm not paranoid. I don't have a whole thing about meta and stealing your data or anything else. Um, Chris does, but, but I, I don't. Um, and, uh, and so I don't care. All I care about is the fact that I sudden, I never think about charging my phone during the day. It's fully charged in the morning um, usually. And then it's, it runs until the evening and it's usually still at like 50%. And I could probably run almost two days with it. If I turn off, it's funny, I, I pull the SIM card out because I have, right now I'm in the process of switching from one phone to the other. It'll last for a week. Like without the without the cellular coverage, uh, an iPhone will last for like a week on one charge. It's incredible. And so you, it gives me a sense of what what's causing all of that, that, uh, that usage. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, if you pay attention to all the, you know, rumor mills and whatnot, there, there have been many times over the last few years where, Something will come out that, you know, one app has got a, a bug or a problem and it's really causing your battery to, uh, you know, to go wonky. Uh, Nigel, test note, Tesla news. I saw a Cybertruck in the wild yesterday on, high, okay. on Highway 1. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, in <laughs> in this episode of ADD. Uh, anyway, so the um, <laughs> squirrel. Um, anyway. On. It was, it was I'm, 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 connected. This has restrained me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Next next question. Next one comes from our friend Cindy Drozden, Erie, Colorado. Hi, Cindy. Uh, I use Lumix Tether app with a Panasonic G9 connected to a 10-foot USB cable, a dummy battery for power. One-shot autofocus gives an error message sometimes. Turning the camera off and back on, quote, fixes it. Has anyone have any experience with this? Go ahead, Alex. I have other Lumix cameras. I would like to know what specific error you're encountering. I did a little bit of searching and uh, I have found some people that have had uh, issues related to this. Uh, the first thing that I would check, make sure your G9 has the latest camera, if you, uh, sorry, the latest firmware update if you haven't already done that. Uh, I was just looking on the download page and I'll post a link here, but the latest firmware version is 2.7, which is actually 2022. So it's actually pretty recent. Got a lot of bug fixes, so if you haven't updated, do that first and see if you still have the problem. If you still have the problem after that, uh, could be could be something else. I, I've seen some people have some hardware related problems with these, so we'll have, we can work through it after on um, Discord if you want to. Next question, uh, Yorgi Bor. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, just moved around. Bortnik uh, in Swissvale. What booth is Eric Hertz at this week in New York City? Will the group be covering his booth live for the show? You know, I'm not certain what booth it is. I think he was looking at, I think, 356 or something in that range, or the three 350 range. Um, there's like a little area in that in that in that area that we're that we're open. I know that I was talking about some stuff there. So, um, so hopefully, uh, we'll we'll find out exactly what it is and make sure you know what it is. We're excited to see what Eric's going to show there. Um, I'm sure it's going to have to do with streaming, low latency streaming, high quality streaming, um, and uh, and we will work on trying to bring that in. We're going to do some coverage that is happening. Um, uh, in after hours, and we'll we'll post some more information about that this week. 
Um, next question. Jack Ruppel, Breckenridge, Colorado. I have a camera that uses the Android operating system. I think 7.1 is it, it is YM, a YIM1 mirrorless only charge light. Can I hack the, into Android through the SD card firmware? Uh, you may be able to do that, but your phone may never work again. Like, you know, like it, you know, I, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't necessarily, especially when you're not dealing with an actual phone, when you're dealing with a, uh, when you're dealing with a camera that's using the Android operating system, it may be pretty sensitive to exactly what, how it's using that Android operating system. And I don't think I would try to change it without the manufacturer, you know, doing the work for you. Uh, you may be able to hack it in, but you may brick it. No, you just need to be clear that you're, you're stepping into a place that is, is dangerous. You just don't want to be too attached to that camera if you're going to start experimenting with it. Go ahead, uh, Jason. Yeah, your way in in this case would be through the bootloader. But just as Alex said, do so at your own risk. Next question. Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the liminal goodness has blessed many apps with the Zoom integrations, vMix, Wirecast, Tyler Live. The included Zoom client, however, is not capable of logging in and thus unable to join registered meetings. Are there workarounds from the apps or meetings settings? You know, I think that this is actually a, um, in this case, that this is a limitation of how the SDK works. And so the SDK is really designed to provide the, um, the backend tools for, um, you know, it's, it's designed to have the backend tools actually be able to talk to each other using Zoom's infrastructure. But I think that, that from a security perspective and a workflow perspective, I think there's been a little bit of sandboxing going on that basically disconnects, um, you know, doesn't have you just be able to have these things jump into it. If you want that, then you're coming back to Zoom ISO. So if you want to have a meeting that is going to be us interacting the way we do in this show, and then have it be something that is um, being being brought back into something you're going to use Zoom ISO for that. For the tools that are using the Zoom platform to make those connections, whether it's vMix or Wirecast, the title or live, uh, Isadora, all of those tools, um, those are designed to use the Zoom infrastructure, but not necessarily interact with the um, run-of-the-mill uh, user. That would create an entirely new set of security issues, stability issues, um, interface issues. There's lots of things that, that that would become very complex. And so I think as a result, um, there's not really a way to integrate those two things together. That's my understanding of how that actually works. So something to think about. Next question. Next one comes from Michael Tan in San Diego, California. Is it still worth getting a camcorder like the Canon XA75 for live streaming? And what do you think about camcorders? I go, Bill. The biggest downside to them is they tend to have relatively small chips, third inch and, and, and smaller sometimes sensors, which means that you're going to have a depth of field challenge. Everything is going to be in focus from the beginning to the end. Also, camcorders tend to have a lot of things which are really good for using it as a camcorder, but not that great for streaming with. For example, they often have rocker switch zooms that have huge ranges, most of which is completely useless if you're putting a camera behind something for streaming. So can they be done? Yes. Are they the the most preferred solution? Not really, because I think most of us like the kind of pictures you're seeing here in office hours, which is our background is thrown out of focus, so it's not as distracting. It's more focus on the person talking. Uh, and camcorders, generally speaking, aren't great for that. They'll do a nice picture, and the ones that have HDMI out can feed into a, a thing like a little ATOM switcher very nicely, but it's just a look. Courtney, real quick. A lot of times, one of the problems you run into is batteries because a lot of them don't necessarily have an external power in that uh, is going to either require a battery to be on there to charge uh, or it'll shut off automatically if it's uh, AC powered over its external power supply. So you might have to get a dummy battery to put on it in some of the camcorders. I'm not sure if the one you mentioned needs that, but look into that because you might have to get a special adapter to run it uh, full time without it shutting down. And we'll be talking about business structure for your business uh, in just a minute. Um, just some quick reminders of what's coming up in the next, uh, in, during this week. Of course, tomorrow we have Eric Geisler coming on, and he is a two-time Emmy winner and a very prominent uh, authority in post-production and a good friend of mine. And so, so uh, Eric's going to be on, and he's going to be talking about answering your questions about uh, visual effects production and, and production in general. So it's really going to be a great uh, second hour. 
um, uh, on Wednesday, we're going to talk about how to choose a mixer. There's lots of mixers. There's analog mixers and little digital mixers and big digital mixers and virtual mixers. And we'll talk about what you should be thinking about when you're actually choosing that mixer. On Thursday, um, Dato uh, uh, Valentic from Color Lab AI. Now, this is basically doing color correction um, with AI. And they've been building up for the last couple of years. They've been way ahead of it. This isn't something new. And so data is going to be uh, on the show with us to answer your questions and show you what Color Lab uh, looks like. Color Lab, of course, works in Resolve as well as Final Cut and Premiere. So there's a, a lot of different ways to use it. Um, so it should be really interesting. And on Friday, uh, the Zoom team is back. Andy Carluccio, uh, Jonathan Cocatello, and Sam Kakaiko will be on um, to talk about Zoomtopia and talk about what it took. There was a very, very impressive <laughs> uh, back wall that they built uh, at a much lower uh, impact than they had last year. So it's going to be really interesting. Quick reminder also, if you're interested in being a panelist, go to officehours.global slash panelist, fill out that form and we'll send you an email and uh, we'd love to have you join us here on the show. Let's jump into the second hour. Welcome back to the second hour. And we're here to talk about, uh, uh, business models. So a lot of us, you know, <clears throat> we start off usually as freelancers and we're like, Hey, can we fill out this 1099? But eventually you have to grow up and turn it, turn it into a real business. And the question is, is what should you be considering uh, when you do that? And we've got some great guests here. Uh, Jason and Ryan Kerala um, are both here and they, these, are, these are our legal experts. Uh, they're gonna be talking about that. Jason um, is a legal technology entrepreneur and a lawyer with extensive experience in, in major American law firms, specializing in complex business disputes. Uh, he holds an MB, a BBA, an MBA, and a JD magna cum laude from University of Miami. Uh, Ryan Kerala uh, also worked uh, as a judicial law clerk in uh, the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida and has uh, held prominent bar positions. Currently, he consults uh, at the intersection of law, media, and technology and serves as a lawyer in residence for a venture-backed technology startup uh, in digital legal proceedings. Uh, welcome, Jason and, and Ryan. Good to have you here. And, um, and so as we start to think about this. Um, how do you, when someone comes to you and says, I'm thinking of, of turning my, and I'll throw this to, 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 uh, to Jason to start with, uh, I'm thinking about, uh, creating a business. What are the first questions you start to ask to figure out what that should look like? Uh, thanks, Alex. <clears throat> I need to start with just a brief disclaimer to say that this is a general discussion that's intended to be educational and perhaps even entertaining, but it does not constitute legal advice. And for advice about your specific facts and circumstances, we recommend that you hire and speak with a qualified lawyer on your own. Uh, and just really quickly also that these comments relate to forming companies in the United States and rules and strategies in other countries may vary dr dramatically. Um, but I think the decision about your company's business form depends on the goals of your business. Um, for this audience, I think we are talking about generally smaller, more closely held uh, companies, more like lifestyle or family businesses. When you were talking before about this transition from being an independent company that operates um, individually as a sole proprietor and then what the next steps might be, that's kind of one direction that you can go in. Um, and then if we're talking about something more sophisticated, like an investor backed startup venture, uh, the need to raise outside capital, foreign investors, um, handling uh, different types of shareholders, maybe going public or operating your company internationally as a not for profit, then you're headed in a completely different direction. I'm going to assume for purpose of this discussion that we're mainly in the first box, but we can talk a little bit about the second box as well. Well, I think one of the questions is always, so you're going through the trouble of starting your business. Do you, and you think, well, right now there's three of us in this business, let's say that we're starting, but we think we could go big. We think we could, you know, raise money to do this. This is a bigger business than just this little thing that we're doing. I think the question always comes up, do we start with an LLC or, or an S corp or do we just go ahead and do a C corp and what, how hard is it to change that structure midstream? Um, I would say my personal feeling on that is if you have those sorts of large aspirations, even if they're, you know, a reasonable amount of time into the future, that it's not that much more 
you know, difficult to find a lawyer and a tax professional and get advice about what it's going to take to form uh, a C corporation and do it the right way. There is additional paperwork and some additional complexities like issuing stocks and, and having a board of directors and things like that. But there are a lot of advantages to doing that as well. If you have that aspiration, this could hit big. I want to take on outside investors, things like that. Then I think for me, at least I would go um, with, you know, forming a full corporation uh, personally. Ryan may have a different opinion on that. Um, I think it would, you know, as you, as you were saying, Jason, every situation is different and uh, it's going to matter about the circumstances of the business itself. Uh, it sounds like most of the folks who are joining us today are uh, looking at having pretty small businesses. Maybe they are, are you know, setting up lifestyle businesses. They're doing consulting type work, media production, and it's a relatively small shop. And, and how would you, cases, from a revenue perspective, how would you define a small business? Um, I mean, I, I would look at it both from a perspective of revenue, maybe, you know, six figures or less, and also just a, a perspective of the complexity of your operations. Uh, how, how many employees do you have? Is it just you or do you have um, a team of people? What does your outside capitalization look like? Do you have, you know, is it just you're kind of just bootstrapping this with a, you know, whatever supplies you have around or are you taking in outside investors? That's going to dictate whether uh, you go with a simplified structure such as a sole proprietorship default or an LLC uh, versus something more complicated like a C Corp. But most of the folks who operate in, in your space, I think... Uh, the LLC model, depending on what state you're in, is is a pretty favorable one. It gives you the limited liability of you know the of a corporation with the simplified corporate structure of a of a you know of a sole proprietorship, and so it's easy to operate in that space. And it gives you and if you can set up say an LLC with an S corp tax treatment, that can provide you with significant tax advantages to make sure that you keep more of the money that you earn. Nigel, you want to add something? Yeah, I was just, I spend my time with a lot of small businesses that start up um, and create partnerships. And uh, someone once told me, if you want to understand what happens to a partnership, look up why people kill each other. And that's typically what happens at the end of the partnership. So um, I, I'm very sensitive to, to small businesses that under-organize because it's their best friend or it's a mate or, you know, it's even, even a spouse or something and that it feels like an unnecessary expense until something goes wrong. And so I, I always recommend people get enough organization behind you legally to protect all the parties because if something can go wrong, it probably will. Well, here's my perspective on that. And this is something that I tell my students um, when I teach uh, business law classes and things like that. The impulse that we often have is to think that bringing paperwork and corporate structure into a business, especially when it's, you know, you doing business with your friends is just going to create more arguments later. And so we want to avoid it. And what I tell people is that it's just the opposite. If you want to preserve your friendships, if you want to avoid acrimony, having paperwork in place that clearly lays out how we're going to operate is how you prevent those arguments. I, I liken it to when you go to your friend's house and you play Monopoly, right? Everybody thinks they know the rules to Monopoly until you sit down and somebody lands on free parking and half the people in your house think that nothing happens and the other half of your house thinks that you get $500 and then somebody else thinks you get all the money that was paid into luxury tax and now everybody's fighting. And if only there was some piece of paper that we could all look at that tells us what happens when you land on free parking. And that's the instruction manual. And corporate structure and contracts, it's just the written instruction manual for the game that is your business deal. So if you don't want people fighting in your house while you play Monopoly, you look at the written instructions. If you don't want people fighting when you do a business deal, have a real corporate structure, have contracts in place so that we all have something to reference when we have an argument and we know exactly what to do. Hey, go ahead, Chris. Uh, Ryan, before we go too far, can you explain what does happen when you land on free parking? I actually do know the answer to this. And the answer and, and is... Are we, and are we not going to... Are we just going to glaze over this? I know you guys have the same last name. Do you know each other? No relation. No. I'm okay. Just, just want to double check. <laughs> uh, we are brothers. And uh, uh, chances are, if you find a Corella anywhere in the continental United States, you can be pretty close to assume that we're at least cousins. Um, 
but the answer to your free parking question is because I, you know, I do look these things up in the rules is you land on free parking, nothing happens. Um, also an interesting piece of monopoly information that a lot of people don't know. If you land on a space in monopoly and you choose not to buy it, the property is supposed to go to auction so that anybody in the game uh, is able to purchase it if they're the highest bidder. A lot of people don't know that because nobody reads the rules, but you know, lawyers like us, we love reading rules. Exactly the rules. I mean, the one, the one thing my, as, a, as a son of a lawyer, you could always know that there were going to be rules that were that that, that you didn't even know existed. That, that, that were going auction to... trick makes the game go quicker too. Yes. It absolutely does. Uh, a lot of times, Monopoly games can last several hours, um, and then everybody gets bored, and it's because of those two things. One, and people think that when you land on free parking, involved. you get five... What's that? And even longer if there's lawyers involved. Oh, yeah. Because we set up whole business deals for, like, you know, landing on properties and things like that. It's a big mess. But right, if you... Because if you, if you have the $500 in the middle of the board there's too much money into the game. And so it takes forever for people to lose. And if you don't have auctions, when somebody doesn't want to buy a property, uh, it's too, it takes too long for people to land on properties. So, you know, read the rules. It makes, uh, whether it's your legal transactions or a game of monopoly, it, it makes things much more effective and efficient. Well, and, yeah. and in some, in some ways it's, it's easier to make some of those decisions, uh, when the, when the train isn't moving yet. Like, you know, like it's, you know, there's, because there's a certain urgency to a lot of things once you get moving. I know outside of business, when we're setting up an event that we're working on, um, I try to have all the hard conversations weeks before the event so that when we're at the event, things are just happening. You know, like you're just, you know, just kind of going through that. And so there's a lot of arguments and a lot of people rolling their eyes about why are we talking about, you know, exactly what time you're going to show up and exactly what will be available when you show up and everything else. But the idea is to get that out of the way, you know, and have it so that when we're, when we're operating, we have that, you know, that understanding, you know, that's, that's there. Um, yeah, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, two quick points. Number one, do not play Monopoly with Ryan. I strongly uh, <laughs> advise that. Um, I mean, we're not allowed to give advice on this as lawyers, but that is good advice. <laughs> you guys set up real estate investment trusts playing Monopoly. <laughs> <That's laughs> and yeah, don't do bar trivia with him either. It's, uh, it's a disaster. But um, going to Nigel's point, and maybe this is a little broader than just corporate formation, but trying to avoid difficult conversations at the beginning of a venture does not make your life better. It only makes your life worse because those uh, uncomfortable issues become more uncomfortable when you pile lots of money and success on top of it, or if you pile lots of uh, failure and liability on top of it. So I think it's always good. And if you ever want a, a great story on this, I think the story of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, which is worth a Google, is is a very... Um, uh, very instructive about why it makes sense to have these conversations early. The music industry is littered with lots of <sighs> handshake deals, you know, like that, that were just kind of like, oh, let's just do it this way and we'll just figure it out later. And, and, um, and then they became just these huge messes of, of, uh, of everyone thinking that they own something that they don't. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and for, for a lot of uh, entrepreneurs like uh, the people in the media department or if you're working as a freelancer, uh, what are the advantages of, uh, and what are the requirements actually for working, and it may vary from state to state, whether you're considered an employee or an independent contractor, tax liability wise and as far as uh, legal wise for the people that are hiring you, do they, can they treat you as an independent contractor these days? Uh, lately, I think in California, they've been moving toward the model that almost everybody is an employee. Uh, and what are the requirements or what are the classifications that determines whether you can be an independent contractor or an employer considered an employee if you're an, a single person working for another, another entity? Um, how, how do we want to corral this? <laughs> Uh, well, I'll start by saying that's a little out of scope for this particular topic, um, but you can rest assured that um, if you are a professional that's bringing very specific expertise into an environment like you have, I don't know, decades of experience doing media production, um, there's a good argument that the company that's hiring you is not 
exercising the kind of control over you that the a lot of courts are going to dictate that you are their employee right this is a quintessential kind of independent contractor relationship um, and there are lots of advantages to being an independent contractor from the standpoint of the person who's hiring you to do the work and from your own standpoint and we can go into those i think a little bit um, but the most significant one is um you know the, the they're not setting aside payroll taxes they don't have an obligation to provide you with insurance or other benefits you're taking all of the revenue that you've earned from the project and taking it in whole and it's going to be your responsibility to handle the set asides for taxes and complying with all of the other legal requirements that you have but it's nice that all the money is actually you know cash on hand for you uh presuming that you're good at collecting yeah, and the challenge has been in California specifically is that they they want to not have to go after the small uh, business, the, 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 the individual. Uh, and so they want, you know, corporations to be built in some way, shape or form to to do that um, so that they can so that you're legally required to do that on a regular basis. I think that that's the that's the, that's the challenge, which is a, more of a specific to California rule than almost anywhere else in the United States. <laughs> not that we're bitter. Uh, uh, next question. Next one comes from Mark Giuliani in the District of Columbia. Please explain the difference between a general corporation, a professional corporation, and their different elections, S-Corp, C-Corp, so forth. Go ahead, Ryan. Well, depending on what state you're in, these are all just uh, different kinds of limited liability structures that exist. Um, if we're looking at, say, the state of Florida, for example, um, a you, know, you have the standard kind of traditional C-Corporation, which is the structure that we tend to see for most businesses that have a considerable number of investors, the biggest companies that you'll encounter in the world are C corporations, a bunch of shareholders owning pieces of your company who elect a board of directors. And uh, that board has a CEO that runs the business from day to day. Um, then you get into some of the structures that we tend to see associated with smaller businesses um, or professional practices. So the professional association or PA uh, is it you know think of it as a a uh, a limited liability entity that doesn't have outside investment usually, and it's typically reserved for people who are providing what are called professional services. So, for example, uh, single uh, member or, or you know one one person shop law firms uh, are often set up as a PA. Uh, doctors, accountants, uh, people who provide professional services will use the PA structure. It's just a, a limited liability separate entity from providing, from setting up the business as just a sole proprietorship. Uh, then you have the S corporation, which is a, you know, a structure that's, you know, d d has, uh, allows for, uh, what's called pass through taxation, similar to an LLC where you're not going to get taxed at the corporate level and then taxed again at, at the individual income tax level. And so there can be some tax advantages there depending on how your uh, entity is structured. But there are a lot of federal uh, rules on um, how many shareholders you can have in an S-Corp um, that uh, uh, foreign citizens cannot invest in S-Corporations. And so you, you want to make sure you're within the line on those entities. And so this involves sitting down with your legal professional having them look at the particular circumstances of your business and evaluating which structure is right for you. Go, Jason. Yeah, and I think the most important step is that one from being a sole proprietor, right, or just operating as an independent contractor and then having some sort of business organization. And the main reason, whether it be um, a PA or a limited liability company or a corporation is you want this limitation of liability, right? When you're operating just as yourself, then you are on the hook directly for the debts and liabilities of the company. And that is not a great place to be in. And it's certainly a conversation you need to have with your spouse uh, and family members if you're going to operate that way. Um, the great thing about any of these forms of, of organization is that you're going to have um, some limitation of liability, which means you can still be on the hook for your own direct liability. But as far as the liabilities of the company, you're only in it to the extent of your investment. And that's a really um, big deal. These um, state specific um, forms of organization like limited liability companies um, are are really in vogue. They're more of a modern take, but I think you get some of the benefits of 
of less formality and less paperwork, but you still get um, the opportunity to elect for the tax advantage and um, the ability to have limited liability. So um, for a lot of folks, and I've seen LLCs that have millions and millions of dollars in revenue. It's not really as much that, but I think um, taking that first step from being an individual sole proprietor to having some form of organization for your company uh, is a very big and important step. Well, and, and again, so where, what are the real key, I mean, I know that you've kind of described it, but what are the real key things between the LLC and the S-Corp? When do you decide to do an LLC versus an S-Corp or an S-Corp versus an LLC? Like what is what are the key factors there that may have? Because C-Corp, I think makes sense. It, like it's like, okay, you're you're taking on investors, you need stocks, you need, there's a whole bunch of things that C-Corp is clear, clearly different than the other ones. But but with LLC and S-Corp, it, it feels like there's, it's a, it's a fuzzier line between the two. Yeah, so um, S-Corp is actually an election that you make under the tax code. Um, so uh, there's a really cool feature in most states with limited liability companies is that you can take what's called an S-Corp election, and this might be the best of both worlds for you. You're telling the IRS, uh, I would like my LLC to be treated like an S-Corp for tax purposes. And what this means is no double taxation. Whatever profit you know, you have on hand at the end of the year just passes through for tax purposes and goes, you know, as income to the owners. And it could be one owner or multiple owners. Which may be right? good or maybe bad, right? <laughs> I mean, like what, the, if you make well, too much. You well, know, what's like it's, bad, yeah, what's bad is getting uh, taxed at the corporate tax rate and then distributing to your shareholders and then them getting taxed as well. That's what right. we're trying to avoid. Um, uh, so, that's one of the major benefits of an S corp election is that you you only get taxed once. Well, and you can um, also with an S corp. Doesn't that also mean that you can take losses? So if your company takes losses, you can write those off as an individual, right? Right, right. Because then your company wouldn't be as profitable or wouldn't be profitable at all. Um, one thing very but, nice, but that would that could positively affect. Let's let's say you have other income that's coming in, and and your income you might be on some tax bracket. Your S corp could if it if it gets losses, wouldn't that be something that's also applied to, like if it loses money in that area, would that be something that applies to your personal taxes as well? Well, that's I, something that applies to the LLC as well. Right, right, right. So for both of those. Right. Um, um, but, you know, the, the other side of that is, and this is why some people eventually move towards the C-Corp structure, is if your LLC has considerable profit, and you maybe and you maybe want to keep that profit in the business and you don't necessarily right. want to give it to yourself then you're on the hook for the taxes of that ll or for the, on those profits in that year even if you don't take the money out of your business uh because there is pass through taxation that's why eventually some people who have you know very large concerns will uh, opt for the double taxation simply so that they don't have to uh, pay individual income tax on the profits um that are accumulated in that year one of the other advantages that uh, you know sole member either LLCs or S corps will uh, do is even if they have a PA or an LLC, they might elect to be taxed as an S corp, like Jason indicated, because there can be some tax advantages for that. Where normally, if you have a LLC, the default is that it's taxed like a sole proprietorship if it's a single member LLC. Uh, which means that all of the profits that are earned by that single member LLC are going to be treated are going to be taxed with self-employment taxes. You know, which is a, you know, it's going to treat all of the income that your LLC earns as you know self-employment. So you're paying both sides of the the FICA taxes, and that's not fun. But one of the things that you can do with an S corp election, um, and you got to talk to your accountants about this, of course, is you can pay yourself a salary. You know, so you can be the share the owner of the business, but also the employee of the business, pay yourself a reasonable salary. And the IRS is going to make sure that it's a reasonable salary. You can't just pay yourself a dollar per year, but then you uh, make it so that you only have to pay the, 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 you know, the, the Medicare social security taxes on what you're paying yourself as the employee. And the rest of the profit is just treated as profit as any other business. And you're not going to be you know, paying employment taxes on those. And that's a, a nice maneuver that you can do, but you got to make sure you talk to your accountant about it and set that up the right way. Um, you know, including paying unemployment insurance tax and, you know, setting up your payroll like you would any other business. 
Yeah, Jason, you were going to say something? Yeah, and, and I'll suggest that there's a lot of great services for doing that um, where you can, you know, sort of outsource that payroll and everything. I, I'm not going to do free advertising for anyone, but I, I will uh, throw that up there. One more advantage to a C Corp that I think is interesting. Now you have to form a board of directors and there's a lot of filing and paperwork involved. But if you think that the that the business itself is going to accumulate substantial value over time that is independent of your in income and loss. But, you know, um, uh, Sterling bought the Clippers for $30 million and sold it for $3 billion. Um, when you form um, a C Corp, you can make an election to value it at the time that you become a shareholder or the sole shareholder at basically pennies per share. And then in the future, if the company ends up being worth millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, um, you can treat the delta, the difference between those two things as capital gains as opposed to as income. Uh, and that's that's a really big deal when you're talking about the top marginal income rate is 35 percent and the capital gains right right now is 22 percent. So that's another thing, I think, to think about when we're talking about the difference between the, these LLCs and other um sort of simpler forms and, and a full on C Corp. Next question. Danny Grizzle in Longview, Texas is interested in the pros and cons of organizing as a nonprofit. He's retirement age, wanting to focus on things that matters to him. Specifically, he's thinking of forming a 501c3 to use his skills to serve other nonprofits. Advice? Go, Jason. Um, there is a lot of paperwork involved in a not for profit, and Alex could probably speak to this as much as anyone as. Uh, Office Hours Global is a 501c3, but um, I think generally you need to be a corporation in order to do this. Um, you have to have some amount of track record and it takes a number of months. Uh, and then you have to, to do a filing with the IRS to get that treatment. And then there's a bunch of rules and you have to have independent board members and lots of other things. Um, my lawyer for these types of transactions happens to be in this live stream. So I will probably defer to Ryan for more information about that. You go, Ryan. Um, absolutely. I, I think I think really where it really comes down to is the formalities. If you are if you want to set up a structure like this because you have a clear nonprofit purpose for this, you know, something that would that qualify as a as a charity or some other kind of a nonprofit structure that is acknowledged by the uh, IRS, and you have the resources to take care of all of the formalities involved, um, whether it's the simple ones, like if you're going to form a non not for profit corporation in the state of Florida, you got to have a board of directors with a minimum of three people. So you got to find three people that are willing to, you know, advise with you on this business. And this board actually has to meet. You need minutes, and you need to record all of the minutes, and they got to vote on your budgets and everything. Um, and that's the simple stuff. And then the complicated stuff, as Jason indicated, is all, all the things that you have to file with the IRS. You don't just become tax exempt simply because you created a not for profit corporation in your state. You have to apply for this tax exempt status with the IRS. Uh, that takes time, that takes money. Um, and depending on the nature of the business you're trying to structure, it could be unpleasant. You have to um, file, even though you're not going to be taxed on the net income of your a nonprofit, if you do it right, you still have to file Form 990 tax returns every year. So there's a lot of formalities involved with that. But if you if you're aware of that and you generally do want to engage in a real nonprofit purpose, then you know it's definitely worth exploring. If if really you're just trying to you just want to set up a business and you you know you don't want to and it's not really about making profit and you just want to do right by the world, uh, you can just have a traditional business that just doesn't have considerable profit and you can still do a lot of these good things uh, without necessarily having to burden yourself with all the formalities of a nonprofit structure. Next question. Mark Giuliani is up next from Washington, D.C. Why are so many corporations formed in Delaware and what are the advantages of being of forming a, vis a business in other states? Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, Delaware. I think, I think at least once a month I get a client who wants to form a Delaware corporation because every other business they see out in the world is a Delaware corporation. And they read something somewhere that says every business worth its salt is a Delaware corporation. So the first thing I'll ask them is, oh, are you trying to create some kind of tech startup that's going to be heavily capitalized with nationwide presence? And they say, no, I'm creating a you know company that's going to make a podcast. Uh, and it's just me. And at that point, I try to uh, 
pull them away from a Delaware corporate structure as quickly as I can. Uh, there are lots of reasons why uh, companies form in Delaware. If you're going to raise a significant amount of outside capital for your business, um, you want to, you know, there are reasons to avail yourself of Delaware corporate law. Delaware tends to have very well thought out, uh, very comprehensive, very company favorable corporate law, which makes a lot of companies want to set up there. Uh, furthermore, it gives uh, the shareholders and the people who operate that company a greater amount of anonymity from the public. Uh, if you've ever tried to search for a corporation on the Secretary of State website in Delaware, it is a huge pain, and they make it that way on purpose. Um, and so if you, if you are looking forward to, if that's the reason why you want to do this, because you're going to raise a lot of capital and you, uh, you know, you're, you know, you want the anonymity, then worth exploring. If you're just, if you're just running like a little business, you know, podcasting or something like that, and you're not based in Delaware, there's not a particularly compelling reason to do it. You're just going to give yourself additional headaches. And if you're thinking to yourself, if I form in Delaware, so I won't need to form in my home state. You probably will anyway, because if your company is actually operating in a different state and you form in Delaware, you're going to probably need to file what's called a foreign qualification that allows your Delaware entity to do business in whatever state you're actually in. So you're just giving yourself uh, more paperwork. So unless you are starting a company that is raising significant outside or intends to raise significant outside capital, um, it's it may not be worth exploring. Go ahead, Jason. It was a very comprehensive answer. Um, I will say that um, you form a corporation in Delaware because your investors tell you to, or because you anticipate <laughs> that you're going to have the kind of investors that will tell you to. Everything about investing in startup companies is risky, right? The vast majority of them fail. So anything that um, serial investors can do to um, be able to limit risk or understand what their liabilities are, they're going to take advantage of it. That's why they push companies to move to Silicon Valley when they fund them, because they understand the ecosystem there and they can put um, them in touch with the right people and things like that. And forming your company and operating a venture somewhere else just adds extra complexity that investors don't like. Delaware is the same thing, right? You want to be in Delaware because uh, the corporate law is very established there. They decided that they wanted to be a haven for incorporation and it's very beneficial to the state which is relatively small so they have better judges they have uh more involved and under you know um uh laws and regulations and things like that that are easier to predict outcomes in and those are the main reasons but ryan is a hundred percent correct um if you don't have those kinds of concerns with your business then you're just adding complexity for no good reason uh if you incorporate there Next question. Craig McFarlane in Boston, Massachusetts comes up next. How critical is it to choose a structure at the start? What are the issues uh, related to switching as your needs change? Good, Ryan. You'll want to, in the early stages of your venture, you'll want to sit down with your legal representation and lay out where your company is now and where it's going to, you, where you want to take it. And so that you can assess what structure might be right for you. Um, again, you know, trying to kind of, uh, pick up the thread from the Delaware conversation. If you are envisioning setting up a company that is going to take in outside capital, um, then you might lean towards uh, a C corp structure early on. But if you are looking at just setting up a lifestyle business, uh, you know, single member entity, just you operating the company, and you just need a corporate structure so you can have the tax advantages and the limited liability that comes with this, um, then you might look at one of the uh, more uh, informal structures like an LLC. And if you, and you know, don't feel pressured to have to get this right. If you, you know, if you start off with a LLC and it eventually becomes a C Corp because your operations change, maybe you started off thinking that it was just going to be a solo business. And then all of a sudden some great idea happened and you're going to, and then, and you want to bring in outside investors. Uh, it's all you, you can always change things, right? You can create a new company that can now take in the outside investors and sell the assets of the old company into the new company. It's a very, you know, typical maneuver. Uh, most uh, transactional lawyers are familiar with this. 
And it's a good problem for you to have. And it's an okay problem for you to have. Wow, your your small idea became a big idea. Now you need a corporate structure that can contain it. No problem. Uh, attorneys can help you with that. Good, Nigel. Yeah, I was just going to tell a, <clears throat> a short story about a business we were looking at acquiring where the uh, owners were a married couple divorcing. And we would have bought that business had they had some better structure. But in the end, it felt like we had become the divorce attorneys negotiating their settlement between them. And so it, uh, just a bit of structure is better than no structure at all. You got Courtney? Is it possible to also switch, if you started out as a C corporation originally organized and had uh, multiple partners and each, uh, it was a closely held corporation, not a publicly held C corp, uh, so that all the participants uh, owned the stock. And eventually, let's say one person bought out all the other participants eventually, and it's still structured as a C corp. Is it difficult to downgrade that from a C-Corp to an S-Corp or to dissolve it and just form a proprietorship if uh, all the stock is commonly owned? Go ahead, Jason. Um, I would say that that is um, not difficult, but it's not necessarily easy. Uh, but like Ryan said, uh, the idea of picking a new organizational structure and then having that organizational structure by the assets or or um, accounts or something of that other company, it would be something along those lines. Uh, my recommendation is sort of the um, ounce of prevention pound of cure. The more planning that you do up front about what your needs are going to be, um, and, and what your goals are, and then trying to build the framework, not just in this corporate structure, but all different aspects of your business, you're going to find um, that you will be, even though it's a little bit more upfront to engage tax professionals and uh, lawyers and take the time to speak with other people in your professional community and get advice about the mistakes that they made so that you can not make those mistakes, I think doing that work up front is always going to pay dividends for you in the future. But I do agree that um, sort of the flip side of that coin is that we can um, spend so much time planning that we don't get to doing the actual work. Um, so I wouldn't get too hamstrung that everything has to be perfect. Like you have customers, they want to give you work. Uh, they're willing to pay you money for it. I think take a little bit of time to plan and think, but if your needs change or your goals change, there, you, you'll always be able to find a way back um, if another path ends up being better for you. Next question. L. Wilson Spiro in Berlin says, I like subcontracting for companies for fun. It lets me focus on programming, which I like, instead of paperwork and contract negotiations, which I don't like. Any suggestions for setting up and or marketing oneself as a subcontractor? And just in general, is it a bad idea? Go ahead, Ryan. Um, generally, I, I never think that, uh, you know, you know, finding a business opportunity for yourself that can uh, be professionally satisfying is ever a bad idea. But you do want to make sure you go about it the right way. I mean, the the first kind of red flag that I would see in something like this is if you're going to freelance, if you're going to become a subcontractor on another contractor's project, and you are already employed by an existing company, make sure that there is nothing about your relationship with your current employer that would prohibit you from doing this kind of extra work as a subcontractor. You want to make sure that you're all squared away there. Um, if you're going to do this work on with any kind of regularity, uh, availing yourself of one of the uh, organizational structures for your business, uh, LLC or a, or an S-Corp or something like that to kind of protect yourself and to get the tax advantages makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think the big component of a subcontractor is that word contract. Make sure that if you are getting into a venture like this with the general contractor on a project, that there is paperwork in place, that it is clear on things like confidentiality, ownership of the assets that you are developing and you know is clear on what the rules are and you want to take that contract to a lawyer and have them review it thoroughly and make sure that you know they under they explain to you what is outlined in this agreement if there's any if there's any terms in there that would be problematic for you to make sure those can be negotiated away before you start the work 
And just by taking care of those sort of basic uh, legal steps, you can, uh, this can be a fruitful project for you, hopefully. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah. And again, this is a conversation slightly beyond um, organizational structure also, but if you are operating as an independent contractor, all of the benefits of having a limited liability company or corporate structure all still apply. But yeah, if you're finding satisfying, enriching work uh, that people want to pay you money for, uh, God bless. That's, uh, you know, wonderful. I will say as a, uh, in my former company, not oh, no, no doesn't do as much of it, but with Pixel Gore, one of the things that was a lot easier is if someone had a business, especially if they're overseas, it's a lot easier to just get billed by the business <laughs> than it was to try to figure out where they were in the world and how that all worked. If they just billed us from the business that they had, it was a much, it was a much simpler structure for us to, to manage. Um, next question. Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana is up next. Have you ever seen the corporate veil pierced? Is this term used to motivate business owners or is it a real issue? Go ahead, Ryan. Here's the unsatisfying lawyer answer. It depends. And in this case, it's we going to We use that all the time, too. Yeah, like, you're, you're, we'll, you're, you're we'll new to our community, but for every <laughs> every answer, like, everything looks simple when you don't understand it. And as soon as you understand it, you're always like, well, it depends, you know? So anyway, anyway, go ahead, Ryan. So for something like this, it's going to really depend on what state you're in. And different states evaluate the question of... Um, the veil piercing differently. Now, just to kind of bring everybody in on this, when we talk about veil piercing, it means that a court has decided that they cannot find the they cannot find a line between where the individual business owner ends and the actual separate corporate identity begins. And so they they see those two things as one and the same, which can mean that the limited liability that that business owner was trying to avail themselves of, can go away. The the corporate veil can get pierced. And now suddenly your personal assets could be at risk if your business is sued. And the risk of this happening uh, is going to depend on what state you're in. In some states, it's very hard to pierce a corporate veil because not only do you have to show that there's no significant difference between the human that owns the company and the business entity because they're looking at all your stuff and there's no we don't see corporate formalities here. We don't see, you know, b board of directors that's meeting regularly. Where's all the paperwork? But uh, they might also say that what we, you need to show is that you might also have to show that that business is using that corporate structure as a way to further some kind of greater fraud, which is uh, much harder to prove. In some states, the that fraud component isn't as significant. And what you have to just show is that there's really no difference between that person and that company. There's not a, a lot of formalities in place. What I tend to advise clients, if I'm looking at their unique situation, is I want to avoid that whole conversation. I don't want to get them, I, I don't want to even get close to a notion of there being a corporate veil piercing. So I'm a big fan of making sure that the companies I work with and the clients of those companies have lots of formalities in place, that there is a real corporate structure, that there is a you know board of directors that's meeting regularly and we have the minutes and there's a separate set of books and, and there's no commingling of funds between the books of the company and the books of the individual owners, because I want anybody to look at this and say, that's a separate company that is completely di distinct from the individuals who own it. Go, Jason. Yeah. And have I seen it? Absolutely. Uh, the vast majority of my career in private practice uh, was in litigation, and this issue comes up a lot. And um, it does not start with, let's examine how the company was operating and then decide whether there's an argument to be made about piercing the corporate veil. The, the conversation generally begins with, where's the money, right? If If you've got this um, sub corporation that doesn't have any money and then a parent corporation or an individual shareholder that does have a lot of money, then you start thinking about this theory of piercing the corporate veil. And then you start looking at the case law and trying to frame the best argument you can make about this. But Ryan, again, is correct that, um, you can, uh, it's your obligation if you're running a company to make sure that you're respecting these formalities um, and keeping everything in line so that you don't leave yourself open uh, to a successful argument like this. Sometimes you can't avoid having the argument been made at all, but it's another reason that significant 
corporate entities form in Delaware because the law is very established in Delaware and it's relatively favorable to the companies. Go ahead, Mark. Isn't it an area where you see piercing of the corporate veil, uh, usually for professionals like doctors, lawyers, architects, where there's a license involved for the state? Well, I can, you know, I can tell you in the in the legal space that, you know, I, I cannot speak to how it is for doctors, but for lawyers, there is already inherently kind of a semi piercing of the veil in our legal practice because lawyers are always personally liable for their malpractice and their negligence. Like we cannot, you know, if we operate as a PA or some other kind of limited liability structure, we cannot hide behind our limited liability to protect our personal assets. Those are always at risk. And uh, I imagine it's probably a similar situation for other professionals because the law wants to make sure that people who are injured by professionals uh, can be compensated. Next question. Mark Giuliani is up next. He was just speaking. At what point should a business register as a foreign corporation? I go, ahead, Jason. Um, I always find this part of the law fascinating because of the structure here in the United States uh, with dual sovereignty, the fact that we, the people, form the United States, but also that states have their own individual uh, state sovereignty. And so um, when I think foreign, sort of traditionally, I think of countries outside of the United States. But in this context, um, that's sometimes referred to as alien, <laughs> which I think of as another planet. And foreign is, you know, a state incorporated in one um a, a company corporate incorporated in one state operating in another. And that is, again, going to depend on the laws in those individual states. But um, this is one of two things, and I'll talk about the other one as well. Um, when you are purposefully transacting business in a given state, you need to look at that state's law and to make sure that if there is a registration requirement, which there usually is, that you file with the Secretary of State and pay the fee and stay active in that way. Um, and the other thing is, uh, and this is unrelated, unrelated, but I'm going to bring it up anyway because it's in my notes and I want to make sure you guys have it. Um, doing business as if you are, if you have, uh, if your company has one name, but it does business as another name, there are similarly filing requirements where you need to let people know that, right? That, um, you know, if I'm XYZ Inc., but I do business as Speedy Plumbing, I may need to register that as well so that when somebody has an issue with Speedy Plumbing, they know what the entity is that they may need to seek redress from. Next question. Douglas Carmichael back with what benefits are there for an individual professional to create an LLC or similar structure, structure even without employees? I go ahead, Ryan. We talked earlier about uh, you know, the general, the two main general advantages to even a simplified corporate structure like an LLC being the limited liability and the tax advantages. Now, admittedly, when a business and an LLC is just you and you don't have employees and you don't have a lot of assets, and it's just you providing direct professional services, the limited liability benefits do get reduced slightly because if you are providing work for somebody directly and you do something that gets you sued, there is a risk that your business could get sued, but also you be sued in your personal capacity because you were the one directly providing that service. And so the limited liability benefits aren't as significant, but there are still some, right? If you, if you contract, if your business contracts with somebody, that contract liability can still be restricted to your individual business. And so maybe there is less of a advantage to this to a separate corporate structure if it's just you and you don't have employees. But either way, there are still the tax advantages. If you can uh, get that S-Corp tax treatment that we were talking about, which allows you uh, to, reduce your, uh, to reduce your double taxation liability um, when you're you know, being paid as an employee, that's still a significant benefit. And, and so generally, you know, for, for most people that are starting an entity with you know, any reasonable amount of income in which they are providing uh, services to others, I would always uh, recommend that they look into some kind of uh, organizational structure, even if it's something as simple as an LLC. Next question. Comes to us from Dirty Bort uh, Chantvery Bortnik in uh, Swissvale. What about LLC and LLP versus S Corp, C Corp, individual sole proprietorships, proprietorships, and so forth? What are the differences? Which one is best for this kind of work in the industry? And what are the legal benefits of each versus the downsides? 
we've touched on a little bit, but go ahead, Brian. Yeah, that was exactly what I was going to indicate is, uh, you know, we, we've, we've touched on the different structures before, and it's going to be a function of the, the size of your company, the activities of it, uh, whether or not you want to bring in outside capital and what your future plans are for this entity. If you are looking at an entity that's going to raise significant outside capital that you do see it as something that is going to be able to scale, then a C-Corp structure uh, starts to look uh, a lot more advantageous. Whereas a smaller business where you're fine with pass-through taxation, where you don't tend to bring in, you're not thinking that you're going to bring in a lot of outside capital, maybe it's just a personal services entity, then at least in the short term, an LLC um, looks uh, a lot more advisable. If you are a providing a professional type service, such as law or medicine or accounting, then you know you might go into the PA structure if your state has a structure like that. Next question. But it involves sitting down with your attorney and figuring out what makes most sense for you. Yes. <laughs> Brett Bielow is back from Appleton, Wisconsin. Is it easier? Is it easy to change from a single member LLC to an S corp? And what is the typical process? And you talked earlier about the fact that you can ask to be taxed as an S corp as an LLC. But when do you decide I want to go from an LLC to an S corp? Go ahead, Ryan. Well, again, you know, when we talk about S corp, uh, that's a, a a tax treatment, right? At least in the state of Florida, you don't you don't create an S corporation. Florida just has a corporation. And, you know, once you create that corporation, it can be taxed as a C corporation or it can be taxed as an S corporation. Similar, if you created a limited liability company in Florida, you can have that taxed as a partnership or a sole proprietorship. You can have that taxed as an S corp. You could technically probably even tax your LLC as a C corp <laughs> if you uh, if you really wanted to get wacky, although it's not immediately impaired to me why somebody would uh, elect a structure like that. Um, and so... You know, having your single member LLC, you can tax it as a partnership or you can tax it as an S corp. And that just depends on uh, what is most tax advantageous for you at the time. And that's going to be a conversation with your accountant. Go, Jason. Yeah. Um, to make it really short and simple, um, the form of your company's organization is going to be a matter of state law and then meeting the requirements under the IRS code for how you're going to get taxed, which is one of the major benefits of being. Um, formed as an organization instead of as a sole proprietorship, that's going to be a matter of complying with the tax code. So those are two different conversations um, that are interrelated. Next question. I have another QR code question from Jerdy Bortnick, and he asks, in this case, the other day someone asked about filing W-8 Ben E form for doing work for a company in New York. Why is this form? Uh, what is this form? How does it work? Is it different if they are hired as B2B corporations versus as, a, versus as independent contractors? And what do U.S. companies do to hire foreign vendors? It's a pretty complicated one. I don't know if you if, if you guys have dealt with this. This is you know basically independent contractor. I think it's the file that what you file to be an independent contractor for a U.S. corporation. If you're someone that's foreign, have, has that something you've dealt with at all? I, I wouldn't be inclined to jump in on this one without researching it a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> it's complicated. Yeah, um, I I happen to know um, a corporate lawyer who is uh, barred in New York and he's on this call, you may want to reach out to him or someone else later uh, to dig into this issue a little deeper. Um, it is way outside of my uh, professional experience, so I'm going to stay away from it. Next question. Next one comes from John Snyder in Reno, Nevada. And John asks, what have been the biggest trends and changes to business structures over the past 10 years and why did they develop? Have you seen any anything that's changed? Has this mostly remained pretty stable, or is, are are people getting creative in any way, shape, or form? Or what are, what are people kind of taking on? I I mean I wouldn't say it was over the last ten years, but I think these um, more recently than the history of corporate formation, uh, these limited liability entities that are uh, less formal and have less requirements than a full fledged corporation, limited liability partnerships, limited liability companies, professional associations, things like that. I think that's the real innovation. It's giving some of the um, tools and advantages of uh, more sophisticated organizational forms in the hands of people who would otherwise be operating as sole proprietors or as partners with direct liability. Um, and I think that's the real innovation. Uh, Every, um, it seems like every year in different states, they come up with different 
uh, sets of initials or different types of companies or form forms like that, like a, a limited liability limited partnership in some states, which is an LLLP. So those those innovations are happening at the state level all the time, um, which is why you want to sort of dive in and see what's available in your state or your jurisdiction when you're going to make those decisions. Um, but I think that that's the real advancement is having these different uh, types of options that are more custom tailored to small business needs. Jordan Ryan. And I would just quickly add that if you're looking for a trend in the last decade that has even more accelerated people wanting to opt for these uh, more simplified pass through tax structures, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 uh, create an additional tax incentive for pass through businesses where you can get, I think it's like a 20%, uh, just off the top tax cut on your, uh, on your profits. And so that made a lot of people really see the, uh, you know, the value in those structures. And, you know, you probably, I, I would have to look at the numbers to be sure, but I assume we saw a significant growth in pass through businesses after the passage of that law. Next question. Roscoe Jones, Madison, Indiana. Are there any legal benefits to being a minority-owned business, or are most of those benefits found in negotiating contracts? Um, oh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll field this one. Uh, there are tremendous benefits state-to-state. Uh, -state. Um, it's not really a corporate formation question as much as looking at what the, your individual state's um, offer. There are incentives for female-owned businesses, for minority-owned businesses, for veteran-owned businesses. This is really big right now. Um, there are uh, corporate social responsibility programs inside companies where they favor these sorts of statuses. So it's not just working with governmental entities, but if you're working with large socially conscious uh, corporations, uh, you need to look and see what those type of programs uh, offer. Um, and it's also uh, an opportunity for businesses to subcontract or bring in uh, minority or veteran-owned or women-owned businesses to work with them. It makes a big difference with a lot of companies about whether you're getting hired or not. So th there's lots of good reasons. Yeah, and one of the things that's really interesting about that, we've we've had some experience with that. And it and the, the interesting thing is, so a very large company does a good big contract. They're required. There's a certain percentage of that that's required, especially if it's a government, a large government contract, to include minorities and include um, you know, uh, you know, all, all, you know, there's all kinds of extensions, small businesses, small businesses with minorities or veterans, all of those things. And at first, th and sometimes um, there's some resistance to that because people say, well, they don't have the same experience level or, or other things like that. But the real goal here is to give them a seat at the table. <laughs> like you don't, you don't, the only way to get experience is to, is to get access. And um, providing that access has been um, part of that contracting business. And it's really, really been an effective way to help people uh, build up their businesses. And um, so you should definitely think about that um, uh, diligently. Next question. John Snyder in Reno, Nevada. At what point should someone start speaking with a lawyer versus self-serving with tools like LegalZoom? Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Well, I'll start with the really annoying answer that you always want to have a lawyer involved if you're going to start a business. And, you know, I, I know that people find getting lawyers involved early is expensive, but oftentimes not bringing in a lawyer early is winds up being the far more expensive proposition. I liken it to uh, going to a general practitioner for your regular checkup versus waiting and not getting you those things taken care of while they're still small problems. And then they become big problems that require major surgery, i.e. a litigator. That's much more expensive than a lawyer like me would be to look at your problem. But also mindful of just the realities of the world and and you know not everybody has you know the the kind of legal budgets that you wish you had that being said i think there is an you know an argument to be made for at least a hybrid model if money really is an, an issue is sitting down with a lawyer for an hour and ha talking through your situation with them giving having them give you some basic thoughts to begin with if that's what you can afford at the time and maybe get some guidance on if you're going to use one of these tech platforms like a legal zoom um to help you set up something uh that might make sense for you like there's actually a you know not that we're giving out uh information for tech platforms that we think are good but um i i've had a couple clients who have used a platform called stripe atlas to set up their c corporations um and do I think that it's that's as good as having a lawyer set up your corporation for you? No, but it's decent. But if you sat with a lawyer 
for an hour or two to get some initial thoughts from them on how you can set it up and then use those insights to do self-help with a platform like Stripe Atlas, you're going to end up with a better result than if you just don't talk to a lawyer at all. Go, Jason. Yeah, I know we're short on time, so I'll keep this really brief. Um, you got to find the right lawyer, right? If if you're starting a business and it matters, having somebody who understands um, is going to work with you and want to grow with you and therefore, you know, help, help you set up. But then I also think this is an unprecedented time where there are more tools available uh, than ever to help um, people along the way. But definitely uh, checking in with a lawyer, getting some advice. Once you do it right the first time, you may require less advice as you do the same thing the next time as well. Jason and Ryan, thank you so much for coming. Uh, just really, really informative uh, hour. Really glad to have you here. So thank you. Thank you again for, for uh, taking the time out to, to hang out with us. Our pleasure. Uh, and uh, thanks to the panelists uh, for the first hour and the second hour being part of this conversation. We can't do this without you. And we also can't do it without the um, producers asking all these questions. We're sitting here just answering questions. It's a real short show if you don't, if you don't ask lots of questions. <laughs> so, so anyway, thank you uh, for uh, keeping the show going every single day. I, I think we did the calculation. I don't have an exact number, but we think since we started, we've, we've answered over 55 thousand questions so it's uh it's it's turned into a pretty big stack of questions that we've answered over if you do it every day it turns out it starts to add up so uh so anyway so thank you for all of those questions that you've generated as producers and thanks to the incredible team on the back end that makes this happen every single day seven days a week um, we have people here who are cutting the show and, and making sure that the show goes forward and managing the show and seeing who's going to show up and and who's going to be part of this and also designing the back end that makes this whole show go and we appreciate everybody's contribution. Uh, we traveled 73,000 miles in the Tlaloc Traversal today, answering all these questions. That's 117,000 kilometers, and that is 578 million bananas for scale. All right, let's go ahead and jump into after hours. I got some small bananas at the at Whole Foods today yesterday, and I was like, I should bring the little banana because then we could do substandard a bananas. That'll not go off the whole system. They're for just scale. little. They're small. They're not substandard. They're just small. They're, just, they're like little finger bananas. It's, they taste pretty much the same as the regular bananas, but they're smaller. So you feel like I feel like half a banana. You don't have to cut the banana in half anymore. You can just get a small. We banana. need the Banana Institute to establish some standards here. This is getting entirely out of hand. I mean, this is the, the imperial banana, disc. not a metric banana, but an imperial banana because it's it's important. We need a legal Banana disclaimer. The Institute of Weights and Measures has something yeah, exactly. to say about that. Yeah. Banana links but, are for entertainment purposes only and not com but, computed to be. Banana active. issues aside, I'm very excited to participate in the whisper for the first time as well. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, please whisper our, our legal disclaimer, okay? The previous program was for entertainment purposes only. I was like, I was going to say at the beginning when you said, when you said, uh, when you gave the disclaimer, I was like, now you know you're actually talking to lawyers because they're going to give you a little disclaimer. Not necessarily constitute <laughs> advice. <laughs> That was perfect. Listen, I, I saved a bit uh, under Florida law. I'm not. We're not allowed to be called experts. Also, oh, I forgot. Oh, I forgot. Unless, that. We, unless we have a board certification in corporate formation or something, but that's okay. I apologize. I that was my faux pas. So, so. I, well, it's a really yeah, good no, show, just, though. You guys did a fabulous funny. job. Thank you. Thank you. For yeah, being it, was, <laughs> it was really well, good. Really well done. Yeah, hopefully, I'll get you. Uh,